We should get, let's get to the serious business of college admissions. So I'm Ethan, I'm the college essay guy. If you've never met me before, I spend a lot of my day sitting in a room thinking about college essays and admissions and writing about it. And I do a bunch of free resources and stuff. And my guest today, and this is, we're recording this as a podcast. This is kind of a special event. We're recording this as a podcast. My guest today is Tom Campbell from Pomona. And I'll say how we met in just a minute, but Tom, will you just give your sort of bullet point bio or how you got into admissions or whatever sort of short intro you want to give the folks? Absolutely. First of all, Ethan, thank you so much for having me on this this webinar podcast moment. Uh, very, very exciting for me. I love talking about college admissions and you know, especially doing a lot of debunking of what I see out there in terms of misinformation and misconceptions. So um, this opportunity has been really exciting for me. Um, so hello to everyone else who is tuned in as well. So excited to see so many of you joining us today. Uh, so my name is Tom Campbell. I use he, him pronouns. Um, I'm a current assistant dean of admissions at Pomona College in Claremont, California. Um, it's one of the Claremont colleges, if you've heard of the consortium before. Um, and I got my start in college admissions actually working at the College of the Holy Cross in Worcester, Massachusetts, which is my alma mater. Uh, go purple. Uh, you know, bleed purple is kind of the motto there. Um, Dr. Anthony Fauci is an alum of Holy Cross. So huge shout out to him for just really repping the charge with COVID-19 and being such an incredible and inspiring person to watch from afar. Um, so if I can be anything like Fauci, my man, I have socks actually that my mom got me that are Anthony Fauci. So he's definitely an inspiration to me. But yeah, my mom also says that I was born a star because my birth was filmed for an educational purposes for a nursing class. So and yes, I have seen the film. So that's another one of my fun facts in my intro. I love it. I love it. Yeah. Well, we're going to talk today about a bunch of different things. Some of the things we're going to talk about, just so folks are aware. We had, by the way, like 100 questions submitted. We're not going to get to all 100, but we've done I think a decent job of synthesizing and hitting on some of the big themes. So we're going to talk about, you know, the, the sort of theme for today was like behind the scenes of an admissions office. Like, what is it like? What is Tom's job like? Um, what happens once you hit submit on an application? We're going to talk about testing and test optional things. We're going to get into COVID and what was the season like, you know, reading for you. We're going to talk about essays and what does Tom look for? What does Pomona look for? And we're going to talk about something called demonstrated interest, which some of you have maybe heard of, some of you haven't. And then we're going to spend some time getting into the questions that y'all submit. So feel free to throw questions into the chat box. We've got Ashley standing by who's going to grab those and throw them onto a Google Doc that Tom and I are sharing. I want to start with what is life, what is your job like right now? It's April. You know, what what are you doing right now? What, what's life like in the admissions office at Pomona? You know, the engine is a roaring. <laughs> That's the best way to describe it. Um, going 47 miles a minute. That's a Pomona reference. It's our special number, um, which I guess doesn't really sound that fast, but it does feel very fast. Um, so yeah, during April, that is the primary month that us in admissions are uh, working to put on programming for students uh, who are admitted to the college, you know, right? So we, had, we released admissions decisions at Pomona uh, around the third week of March. Uh, so around like March 20th, I want to say was when we released so at that point onwards, it's kind of just a race against the clock until May 1st um, mm -hmm. to basically tell students why Pomona might be a good fit for them and put on different open houses virtually, different opportunities for students to engage with the college. Um, I do a lot of work with that. That's actually one of my primary responsibilities. So putting on our, yeah, our virtual open houses, we have like four different themes for them. One's all about academics and outcomes. One is all about social and community life. One is about the Claremont Colleges and a chance for all the admitted students across all five schools to get to know each other and bond and learn more about clubs, organizations, resources. Um, and the first one that we did was just kind of like an introduction, kind of all the big buckets were covered in that event. Uh, we also do a lot of stuff. I run Pomona Admissions, which is, I'm like, Ashley, you should plug it in the chat. Um, it is our admissions Instagram account. Um, happy to provide the link. Uh, so we do a lot of like videos on there, takeovers from both alumni, current students, lots of different groups to talk about the Pomona experience. And yeah, just trying to be as accessible and as welcoming as possible to these students who put in so much time and work mm -hmm. and, and effort and oftentimes finances, you know, paying to apply to the college. Um, and so honoring that and just really hyping them up and letting them know, them know that this is a huge deal to be admitted to a place that is so selective um, and 
is really looking for these students who are the best fit. So that's a big part of kind of what my job looks like right now. It's lots of weekend work, you know, it's lots of sessions kind of beyond the nine to five and, um, but they're the most exciting sessions, you know, and it's the most exciting part of the year for me because you actually get to meet the real people that behind the stories that you read about mm-hmm. and behind, of course, the stats and all the kind of pieces that go into um, admissions as well. So, yeah, it's definitely one of the most satisfying, but also time consuming parts of the year. And it seems like there's an interesting shift at this time of year where students have spent the better part of a year working on their applications and in some sense trying to convince the college, hey, pick me. And now it seems like Pomona is in the position of saying, hey, pick us, right? And that seems to be related to yield a little bit. Will you say for folks, what is yield and why is this such a, you know, how is that dynamic shifted and like what's going on in that sense? Yes, it, the tables have turned, right? <laughs> you know, the gatekeepers have done their job. Students have been informed. Um, and at this point now, you know, we are just waiting to hear back from students as to whether or not we're the place they want to enroll at. And usually most, the vast majority of students end up letting us know like right before May 1st or the day before or day of. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's kind of, it's one of those things that's really hard to predict, but we have a wonderful data person, shout out to Chris Turan, he's awesome, who does a lot of work in terms of like projecting those numbers and looking at previous past experiences and cycles to get a sense for mathematically an estimate of how many students will end up you know, saying yes to our offer of admission. So that's a big part of it. It's a lot of data coupled with looking at previous responses and surveys from students in the past as to what they wanted to get out of April, like what type of programming was most helpful in making their decision. How can we best, you know, provide opportunities for them to get a comprehensive Pomona experience, especially in this virtual world, which is, you know, obviously very challenging when we can't do these on-person, in-person events to really get that joy de vivre of the school. Um, And yeah, so a lot of it has to do with just looking back at previous modeling. But of course, with COVID, it's kind of one of those things where we're like, Mm -hmm. we don't really know quite how much this this process was so unique this year. So we're hoping that the calculations have been (laughs) correct and that obviously we don't want to over enroll because then we don't have enough spaces to put people in terms of the residence halls. Um, But the other downside of that is, you know, coming in under your number, you go to the wait list, which is great for the students who are on the wait list that they get a chance to maybe come to, you know, their dream school if that's Pomona. Um, But yeah, it's definitely a balancing act and one that's like hard to predict, but, you know, data can definitely be helpful in getting to that point. Yeah. And just to be explicit for some folks who may not know what yield is, like basically Pomona has accepted X number of students, but they can only, you know, Pomona can only enroll Y number of students. So part of all this work that Tom is doing is to try to make sure that they come as close to that number as possible. And then, right, there's like this wait list. We're sort of like, okay, we can, we've got some number of folks who, and if enough students say no, then we can kind of move to that wait list and start to put the class together. I want to talk more about wait lists in just a minute, but let's move back even before, like walk us through what happens from the moment a student clicks submit on their common app, they've hit, you know, enter, ah, they've done a sigh of relief. And then what happens between then and when they get an email back from Pomona or whatever they get back from Pomona saying, congratulations, you're in, or sorry, you didn't make it, or hey, you're on the wait list. Right. Yes. The, the evolution of the application along the the quick the months do go by really quickly when you think about it. Um, but I know for those on the waiting end, it's it's it doesn't feel quick at all. It feels endless. Um, so yeah, once a student submits their application to Pomona, um, the very first step is kind of just you know making sure that we're training ourselves to you know make sure that we're reading the applications as comprehensively as possible. Um, a term that many folks maybe may have heard of before, but some might not have it, is holistic review. Um, So that's a lot about basically the fact that we are considering multiple different aspects of an application, both quantitative, you know, information, grades, you know, GPA, your rigor of classes. Um, In this case, this year we were test optional. So testing for some students, about half the students who applied was a factor of the conversation. The other half, it was not. I know we're going to talk about testing in a little bit as well, which I love to talk about. Um, I sincerely mean that. and um, <laughs> said no one ever. <laughs> I like to talk about it because I like to talk about the reality of how it plays out in, in college admissions. But anyway, the other side is going to be the qualitative things, right? You know, writing samples, essays, of course, college essay guy, right? Like that's a big part of kind of how we are gathering whether or not a student is a good fit for us. Um, but yeah, so once this, once the application is submitted, basically it gets farmed out to um, 
our admissions officers. So at Pomona, we have uh, 15 admissions officers, I want to say, um, who read for a different part of the world. So each of us has a geographic territory that we are in charge of in terms of, you know, in the fall, a big part of our job is, you know, recruiting students and also going to do events and sessions and meeting with students and families to tell them more about the college. So my particular territories, for example, are Washington State. So shout out for anyone who's tuning in from Washington State, as well as Maine, New Hampshire and Vermont. And this particular application cycle, I was also reading students who apply from the continent of Africa uh, while my colleague Ashley was on maternity leave. So that was another kind of added uh, application cue into my mix. Um, and it was uh, definitely a, a big uh, increase in terms of volume of applications I was reading uh, because uh, I think in, in wake of the test optional move for many colleges, we saw a surge in applications from Africa in particular. Um, so that was definitely, it was a lot, uh, but really, really satisfying. And that's actually how we got connected, um, mm -hmm. which hopefully we have time to share that story a little bit. I'd love to. Um, but yeah, so so basically in my queue is what it's called in, in our like application management reading system we start to move into reading the applications once when everyone has submitted. And the way that Pomona uh, reads applications and evaluates them is through a process that we call CBE, which stands for Committee-Based Evaluation. Ethan, you may have heard of this before. Some folks on the call may have heard of it. For those who have not, essentially what it means is that the file is being read by two admissions officers at the same time. And that is a way for us to be able to have a dialogue and conversation about each file that we're reviewing in that moment in time. and lean on you know the two partners the two of us um, as opposed to one person exclusively making the decision um, so in this first phase the cbe you know reading phase is what we call it this usually is happening you know all throughout the month of january and um, a decent amount of february as well um, actually really kind of towards the end of february um, so it's a long time um, and we do it all over zoom right now currently so you're reading applications um, and you just have like a Zoom chat open um, and video with one of my colleagues. And the way that we divide it up is that in CBE, one person takes on the role of the driver and one person takes on the role of what we call the passenger. And the driver is someone who is the territory manager, who's kind of like the one who's the expert in the region, who understands the particular curriculum that's offered in that state or country or area within a state, right? If the, you know, this uh, school system, for example, in Washington state, there's a program called Running Start, um, which is basically an early college, uh, community college classes while you're still a high school student. So it's like my job as a territory manager to understand the school context that the student is coming from. So I'm reading through the application and I'm spending a lot of time focusing on the transcript, on the rigor of classes that the student has taken, I'm pointing out, you know, what, and the questions I'm asking myself are, okay, what did the student take? And what did the student leave on the table based on their school's offerings? That's a big way, to, good way to kind of think about what myself as someone who's reviewing an application is asking myself. It's not, is the student taking APs? Because at some of the schools, they don't have APs. And right. that's not to the you know, detriment of the student. That, that is their school. That's their curriculum. We honor what the, the individual high schools have chosen is best for their students to help them learn and to grow as intellectuals. And it's not our job to be like, well, you should have gone to the IB school down the road. Like that is not how we view that. Um, so we don't have a preference between AB, AP or IB or other advanced rigor or none of that at all or community college classes. We really honor kind of the process and the, the availability of courses based on that particular high school. I'll also be looking at things such as um, the school profile and a little bit of information about, you know, um, how many students, for example, from that school are going to four year colleges. That gives a lot of us on the admission side of things a sense for preparedness for the rigors of a highly selective school. And other information that's really helpful from that school profile is something that I'm taking into consideration. I'm evaluating as I'm going through these files. And typically we read in what we call school groups. So we usually read the same school all at the same time to be able to understand and look and see, okay, like here's what the school is sending to us. And we have historical data. Usually it's actually at this point about eight years back of applicants from the school in the past. So we see like what types of classes at the school like are a rigorous curriculum for that particular school. And that's kind of how we're making that quantitative assessment by and large. Um, the passenger, on the other hand, is going to be kind of like the celebrity guest. You know, they're there um, to show face. You know, they're there to, they are there to just be kind of that second opinion and to really spend a lot of time like being like, hey, like this essay is like really blowing it out of the water. It's so mm -hmm. interesting. It's very, you know, poignantly written or I'm like crying laughing at this, you know, like, 
they'll just kind of fill in kind of a lot of their just overall thoughts on the file and their sense and instances where they're finding, oh, like the student's really doing this amazing work with refugee advocacy. Like that's such a great part of their file. You can find it, you know, on the activities page or you can find it on their Pomona supplement. They're making highlights and notes so that myself as the driver, I'm the one like taking the notes on the file and preparing myself for the next phase, which is the prep phase, which we'll talk about in a second, um, to understand that a little more comprehensively, the whole picture of the student's file. Um, and of course, I'm not always driving all the time. Like I take turn to passenger for other people. So it's nice that we all kind of during this process in the reading phase of that two months or so, we're taking on different roles and we're seeing different areas of the world and reading different stories from different parts of the world because of the way that we kind of divide up the application review. The middle phase is usually in February um, slash early March. Eh, yeah, mostly like February. And that is what we call the prep phase. So that is the intermediary phase where we've reviewed in the reading initial phase all the files that we have in our queue. And now it's up to the territory managers to funnel that number even further, as painful as it is, because at that point, we still are too excited about too many students. And the reality of Pomona's admissions process is that we have to get that number down in order to provide what students want for Pomona, which is guaranteed housing, access to resources, small classes, right? Like mm -hmm. we need to continue that on. So we have to whittle the number down further in order to bring in the class that we need to bring in, which is 415 students at Pomona. I know, super small. Mm -hmm. Some of you are coming from high schools where you're like, that's like the size of my homeroom. Um, but anyway, <laughs> the prep phase is where I take the notes from that initial review conversation, that committee-based evaluation conversation. And I have to create kind of like a prep statement, which is, I, I describe it like a legal opening statement, as if I was like, your honor, this is this is Ethan. And let me tell you about why he should be admitted. I have to write a write up about each student that I'm advocating for an admit or a waitlist recommendation for. Mm -hmm. And that has highlighted quotes from their recommendations, specific quotes from essays. It has instances that I'm referencing particular qualities that Pomona is looking for. So intellectual curiosity, investment in community, um, a commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, and a mindfulness of the importance of that. There's different things that like we're going through the file and, and finding evidence of for mm -hmm. me to be able to articulate, yes, quantitatively, the student's a good fit. But beyond that, here are all the qualitative pieces that also signal that the student should be admitted or, or waitlisted to the college. And that then gets it into the third phase and final phase, which is the committee review. So that is where myself and my colleagues come together in a larger setting um, this year, virtual, and talk about all the different files that we have the admit and waitlist recommendations on. And that's for our chance to re read our preps, to advocate for our students, um, and to see kind of how it shakes out before the um, final few weeks before decision release. At that point, we do a process that's called shaping. That's a really hard process because that's even students who've made it all the different rounds. They've made it past committee, they were in the admit bin, and still at that point, we still have too many students to be comfortable sending out acceptance letters to. So we have to whittle it down even further. And that's a really tough week in the office because it's the students that you really were super in on and just have to unfortunately at that point usually end up moving to the wait list. But there's always hope. There's a lot of students that I love on campus who made it through the wait list process at Pomona. And sometimes they're some of my favorites. And um, yeah, I tell people to keep optimistic about that. But that was a long answer, but hopefully it gives you a sense of the phases. It was one of the most complete answers I've heard to that question. And I so appreciate Thank the you. detail. So let's talk testing. Pomona yes. just extended its test optional policy for another year. And uh, I'm just curious, what was what went into the decision making in terms of, you know, the test optional, you know, the decision, why, why was that decision made? Explain for folks what test optional means. And then, um, you know, I'm curious, is that a for real thing? Like, is that a, you know, is test optional for real? Uh, you know, is it because what I imagine that folks hear and think is like, yeah, they're saying test optional, but really they're looking. So what are your thoughts? Yeah, I feel very passionately, passionately about this topic, and I'm very glad you gave me a platform to speak about it. Um, I first want to just really just like take the elephant out of the room and just acknowledge that, like, I completely understand that there is a lot of mistrust, understandably so, on your end, students and families for college admissions. And there's precedent for that. Right. We've seen national scandals on, you know, played out in news reels about the varsity blue scandal and just many instances where Colleges have broken trust with families and not been transparent about this process. So I completely understand, understand and see why there is so much skepticism around test optional as a concept and a, and a policy that colleges are rolling out. 
but I, I know you don't really know me. <laughs> and I know that, you know, I'm just someone here on this webinar. Um, I'm really speaking this from the bottom of my heart and from the truth of, of my perspective and working in highly selected missions for six years. It truly does mean optional. And I know, you know, directors and, and vice presidents at all these different colleges and universities signed this, you know, joint agreement through what's called NACAC, it's the National Association for College and Admissions Counseling, um, saying that test and optional truly means op optional and really trying to be as explicit and upfront with families and students about that. But I still recognize that there is a lot of skepticism about it. And I definitely want to talk a lot about that because I actually used to work for a test optional institution. So prior to working at Pomona College, I worked at College of the Holy Cross, my alma mater, and it was a test optional school. It has been for, for quite some time. And that was how I was used to reading files, was reading them, you know, about half with testing and half without. And if the testing wasn't there, we just didn't talk about it. It was not a topic of conversation. There was not speculation as to how good or bad the scores were that the student honored. We honor that process. We honor the fact that they don't want to use that as a particular part of their application process. And that is what test optional is. It is you having the choice as to whether or not this particular form of uh, your quantitative preparedness for college is something that you feel comfortable submitting and you feel demonstrates you in the best light possible. Mm -hmm. That decision in this test optional world is completely up to you as a student as to how comfortable you're feeling with that. A good rule of thumb with that is honestly, if you look at a middle 50% of test scores for a particular school, by and large, if you're anywhere in that middle 50% range, you should feel comfortable sending in your scores. I, I go on Reddit. I know about College Confidential. Like I, I see all these kind of students. And I was actually, I was really alarming actually a few weeks ago because I saw a student who was, was writing this post and she was just devastated about how, you know, she was like, I know that the reason I was you know, denied and waitlisted at all these schools is because I sent in my scores and I was such a fool. I should have not done that. You know, and, and the score that she listed in terms of what she was, beating herself up for and crying over in her sleep was a score that was completely admissible, completely mm -hmm. within range would have not like made her an uncompetitive application whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And I think what's really, what I really try to drill home with this point is that the, the overemphasis on what so many of us in, in U S society in particular, and, you know, no, recognizing that there's a lot of international students on this as well, the obsession with merit and, and the, the narrow scope of merit only being defined by quantitative success is really not serving students the way that they need to be served. Um, I pulled some data just out of curiosity, <laughs> hand written on this yellow notepad, um, that in the most recent testing cycle, 2019, prior to the pandemic, which, you know, off lift these uh, stats a little bit, 6,000 students in the world uh, received a perfect score on either the ACT or the SAT. If all those 6,000 students decide to apply to Harvard University, only 25% would be admitted, mm -hmm. right? Like, so I think just really understanding kind of the math behind this and that like perfect scores does not equal shoo-in mm -hmm. for any of these selective colleges and universities. There is so much more to the conversation, so much more that we are factoring into why a student should be admitted. And if your scores are, yeah, again, remotely kind of in that middle 50%, if they're below that 25%, you know, percentile in the score ranges. So most schools will publish a range of say the middle 50%. So between 25% to 75% of students, these are scores that, you know, usually have been admitted. If it's below that, it might be worth thinking about not submitting those scores because they're below profile and you don't need to feel like you need to be pressured to submit them to make yourself more competitive. Um, and then of course, obviously if they're above the 75%, you're showing that you are surpassing what the vast majority of applicants demonstrate for that particular part of the application. But I want to emphasize it's one particular part at Pomona. Mm -hmm. We've done studies that about 75% of the students who apply are academically admissible and viable based mm -hmm. on grades, testing and coursework that they do. Our acceptance rate is not 70%. We mm -hmm. are making decisions largely based on fit for the school, but mostly Institutional priorities, which is a conversation that I feel like does not happen a lot um, in college admissions. And there's a lot of a, a lot of people downplay just how significant these priorities can play when it comes to highly selective admissions. And that's the other piece, too, is that I'm clarifying highly selective admissions. Right. That is schools that admit, you know, less than 10 percent of their applicant pool. That is not the vast majority of schools mm -hmm. in the United States. Mm -hmm. So 
I have a lot of other you know thoughts about that, but hopefully that's I guess a good. It's it's addition. great. And there, there are two things I want to click on. One yeah. is I want I'd love for you to go just a little bit deeper on. Okay, so then absent test scores, how does Pomona put together a class? And then as, as specific as you're willing to be, what are some of Pomona's institutional priorities so that we can use that sort of as a lens into looking at what institutional priorities even look like? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Very happy to be upfront about both these things. So in terms of the reading process for, for understanding quantitative uh, success and a foundation to do well at Pomona, that's, I mean, the primary reason that we look into that is that Schools don't want to have what we call a retention rate that is low and is basically what that signals. If you look at reten college retention rates, it's an S it's a good indicator that students are staying at the school. They're graduating on time. You know, you can look at four year graduation rates as well. Retention rates and graduation rates are a great form of whether or not a school is doing a good job of admitting students who are a good fit for their school. So that's something I think is just a good takeaway for all of you listening to look really closely at retention rates and uh, four or six year graduation rates. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why, you know, we look at the, the quantitative background of students and we're not just doing it to be an easy way to weed, pe weed people out. Like it's not like let's load it into the Excel file and just filter by GPA and call it a day like those two months that Tom talked about. No, nope, we don't need to do that. We absolutely do need to do that because otherwise the class can look really stale or just like not be the exciting dynamic, um, all the different passions and interests and backgrounds and experiences and forms of merit that Pomona brings into the class mm -hmm. would not be possible without the review that we do. Um, because these instances come up in lots of different areas beyond exclusively something that can be filtered or an mm -hmm. algorithm can find, right? Like um, maybe given 10 years, 20 years, maybe that's a possibility, but right now it's it's not. Um, so in terms of how we're, we're identifying a student's preparedness academically, like it has always been their transcript and their rigor of classes and how they've done in that. I know a lot of people ask, you know, is it better to have a B um, in a rigorous class or an A in a standard, you know, a standard college prep class? Um, and it really, the answer as with everything in college admissions is usually it depends, right? I'm speaking on behalf of Pomona and our process. And that's the tricky part for you all as students and families is just knowing that like what I'm saying is definitely a, parallels a lot of what other similar selective schools uh, experience with their application review processes, but that I'm not speaking on behalf of every single college and university. But mm -hmm. in terms of kind of how we got ourselves to be ready to evaluate without testing as a form of metric, it wasn't that much of a calibration, to be completely honest. And I was doing a lot of reassuring of my staff uh, that that was going to be the reality because I had worked at a test optional school before. So I was actually put on what's called an, the Academic Viability Committee. Mm -hmm. um, so that was myself and a few other uh, admissions folks who we were looking at uh, how we can build a class that um, has those quantitative benchmarks that the college feels comfortable with in terms of students doing well in their classes here, staying, not failing out. Um, how are we doing that without testing? So a lot of it is, you know, looking at the school profile, looking at the rigor of classes, like, like the things I mentioned before, right. doing a deep look at a student's writing. You know, so for example, if a student did not submit testing and their grades are great, but there's multiple concerning errors on the writing side of their application. Like we kind of have to really factor that in and be like, okay, in the absence of, you know, reading scores or kind of any other demonstration, like this needs to be a concern that is addressed in committee that, you know, we don't feel super comfort, comfort, comfortable or super mm -hmm. confident in a student that has an application riddled with errors or kind of things that are just not, cohesively written or the train of thought is not kind of following a, a singular path. So that was another big thing that we did a lot of training on. And we got like our writing center, um, a staff member from the writing center at Pomona to come in and talk about like what's fixable in terms of writing and like what's admissible essentially. And what is, is harder to, to unlearn for a student or, or harder for a student to uh, calibrate to, to be able to jump into the Pomona experience and not feel overwhelmed or not feel like, I don't have the foundation to do well here. So that's like a lot of kind of how we, we did the evaluation process. And again, as it always has, the transcript and the rigor and the grades have been the biggest piece for me, mm -hmm. uh, for me, for our office. And then that second point of your question, how did we get to the decision to go test optional and, and prolong our test optional, uh, what we had like a temporary policy for, for two years? It now is four years. So anyone who's applying um, for the next four years, 
um, will not have to submit testing. And that was a joint conversation and dialogue um, with the admissions staff, with faculty and students. Um, we have this thing that's called the, it's called AFAC, not AFLEC, the insurance company, but it is the admissions and financial aid committee. And I guess our mascot is still a bird because Sage Hens, that's the Pomona mascot, our beloved Cecil, the Sage Hen. And this committee meets regularly throughout the, um, throughout the year to talk about issues in our admissions process and different policies that we're advocating for that the college move into. Um, so a lot of it was, you know, I was there in the meetings being like, we don't need the testing. Like it's not essential for us to build a class and we've made that possible by this particular application cycle. And given the barriers that testing has historically presented for so many students in our, in our pipeline and in our pool, in, in terms of accessing the test, being able to do the test safely, especially right now during the COVID-19 pandemic. I've heard horror stories of students, you know, feeling like they need to go and fly on private jets to certain places of the world where the test was being offered, when that is absolutely not what we want students to be doing. That is not our our goal. Yeah, here. how does that land for you when you when you read in an additional information section that a student flew, as we were talking about before you got on, flew from New York to Nebraska to take a test? Like, how does that land for you? It's disheartening and it, it's 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 hard for me to see that and to know that, again, as I mentioned before, I understand why people are doing this because they think that this is what's the tipping point for them. They think that this is the point that's going to get them, you know, to be secure their spot at these highly, highly coveted places that only admit so few students. Right. This this statistic that I I love to give out because I think it just really helps reframe the hysteria around this entire conversation only 3% of 18 year olds in the United States end up going to selective colleges. And a selective college in this case is a college that admits 50% of their students or less. Yeah. So 97% of students are attending colleges with an acceptance rate of more than 50%. Mm -hmm. And the way that this, the, Derek Talbot, is an, as he's a journalist actually for The Atlantic. And the way that he phrased this in one of his 2011 articles was that this college admissions hysteria of selective schools is a crisis of the 3%. And I really like to emphasize that because another equally alarming three percent, or actually I'd say that's not a percentage that alarms me or surprises me because I know, you know, how much the hyper focus on the U.S. News and World Report schools is and the rankings and only these schools people think are the only ones that matter. And it's absolutely not true. Um, the other three percent stat that I, I think is actually, for me, disheartening, just as it is disheartening to hear about students who are flying to places to take an SAT in, in an era when we promised that that does not need to be a part of an application is that only three, this is a Gallup poll from 2014, only 3% of college uh, graduates from this Gallup poll said that basically they felt like their college experience was, I forget the wording exactly, I wrote it down. 3% have the kind of transformative experience in college that fosters personal success and happiness. Mm -hmm. Only 3% reported that that is how they felt after college. That to me is a signal that prestige is taking, you know, that is driving the bus and not purpose. And that is something that I think students really, and students and families really need to start thinking more critically about um, and in not feeling like these schools that I represent, like I work at one of those schools, right? right? Like I see and look at statistics of graduation outcomes for schools that are not as selective as Pomona there are a lot of similarities. Pomona has a lot of great resources. It's in a great location. It's a wonderful school. We only have so many, so much space for so many people, but there are like, Holy Cross, you know, where I went, like, it's not, you know, like uh, a place where people, yeah, like it is a school where the acceptance rate is not as selective as Pomona's, but like the med school acceptance rate is higher than Pomona's. Like there's a lot of things that I'm like, there's a lot that students are doing at these schools that are not the top, top schools. And Holy Cross is very, it, ha it's, it, it has a great reputation. <laughs> like, I'm not mm -hmm. trying to say that. Um, but it does it strike me as something that just really needs to be explicitly discussed more. Because mm -hmm. again, like, I'm not here as a sales rep for Pomona. Like, I'm right. not here to be like, this is the only place where you'll find personal success and happiness. And that is absolutely not true. In fact, right. some students would not find that at Pomona. Right. Um, but I think really reframing that conversation is really important for, for those who are listening today. Well, Thank you. So I want to talk, we might get the, by the way, the institutional priorities thing we might get to like at the end, I but, about that and I totally just didn't answer. It doesn't but matter. It doesn't, answer, yes. it, you, you, but you went back and answered the second thing that you forgot about, which is awesome. So 
pause on institutional priorities for now. I want to get into COVID and talk about that a little bit because we had some questions that come in around that. I'm curious. I'm just going to give you like a, a, a few questions and you pick and choose. You know, one of them was maybe talk a little bit about how reading this year was different. And then a, a student came in with a question in particular. She writes or, you know, they write because of COVID, I didn't do anything exemplary last summer. And I'm not sure of my plans this summer. How should we be spending our time? So I'm going to let you pick and choose in terms of like, basically the topic is COVID, go. <laughs> COVID, okay. COVID is real. Like, and the impacts of COVID and how those have shaken out in our process and how those have been demonstrated to us is very poignant and very real. And honestly, it's very humbling. And I, it was yet another demonstration of, for me as someone with so many privileges to recognize that that is the reality of my life right now. Like I'm able to work safely, I'm still employed. I am able to do this webinar with you all. Um, and so many students that I read this year were not as are not as fortunate and their families are not in that situation. So COVID really, I think in our application process really did highlight the sincere inequities in, in, all, in US society and, and the world really. Um, so for example, I had a student who uh, applied this year who wrote about how um, both of his parents and grandparents all passed away in the two week span from COVID-19. He's living alone with his sister in an apartment at age eight. She's 18 years old and he is finishing up high school. He's She's over 18. He's 18 years old, just finishing high school. They're living independently and all their closest relatives passed away in the span of a few weeks. And he wrote this really fiery essay about how frustrated he gets when people are not you know, adhering to public health guidelines and how he, they, people think that this is not real or that this is not impacting people. And he's like, it's absolutely real. Like, and I'm living, breathing pr proof of that. Mm -hmm. He actually wrote his essay about kind of how he struggled with his faith. He's ardent Christian, really struggled with his faith during that time, which is completely understandable. And then of course you have other students who are, you know, on the other end of the spectrum who are, you know, revealing to us that they're um, disappointed, of course, that, you know, maybe some uh, uh, travel trips, travel abroad experiences that they were hoping to go to were canceled and their sports season was canceled. And of course, like I, I'm not here to to um, to discredit like how hard that is, like as someone who as, and a student who is, you know, going throughout high school, you're, you're pursuing things that you're excited about. You have these great plans. It's, it's devastating to have that just be cut short with no notice and with no autonomy and control. So when it comes to COVID and admissions, like we are human beings. Like I teared up reading the essay about the student who had lost his, his parents and grandparents, like as anyone would, like for that student to be so vulnerable and to be so honest about that, like it's understandable if they're not captaining every club, if their sports team, you know, sports wasn't able to continue on, if they're not able to do their major recital that they've been working for, like we understand that. And I do encourage students not to write about that unnecessarily. I think with this particular student, it made 100% sense for why he decided to write it for his, his essay. Right. But um, for those of you listening, there is a section in the application that will allow you to, um, it's called a COVID response, COVID-19 response. And that is an open open real estate in the common, um, common application or coalition or quest for application or however you're applying to your various schools. Um, that's an open space for you to talk about how COVID impacted your particular situation, whether that's you had to take on extra jobs to provide for your family. We saw that a lot with students who are low income. You had to, um, and there's a student actually, I remember this, she was during the summer, like both her parents got COVID. She had to take on more hours at work. She was opting into a community college class to get ahead for senior year. Didn't do well in the class, understandably, because all this is happening all at the same time. And, you know, we had a conversation in committee, you know, the student got a C in the class. Pomona is not a school that is usually admitting lots of students with lots of C's, right? We had a conversation as a staff about like, okay, this is what we warned ourselves for. And this is what Tom and the academic viability committee told us it possibly might happen, you know, in this, in this world and in this process of COVID, like we prepared for the worst. We were like, mm -hmm. Hey, some schools might only have pass fill grades. Some school. And then in that case, we were like, we're going to do what's called benefit of the doubting. Mm -hmm. We are going to, if a school only is able to do pass fail and that's and the only grades that we have are, you know, pre junior year or first semester, junior year, sophomore, first year, that's what we have, you know, and we're going to honor that the student most likely would have continued to do well in these classes because there's no precedent. I'm, I don't know like the legal terms, but there's no, like, there's no probable cause that the student would not have continued on that trajectory. Of course, we actually saw a lot of schools actually giving grades, but we did see a lot of schools like, 
having to shift their schedules and like not being able to offer all the courses that they typically offer on their profile because of cuts or because of interruptions, things like that. So yeah, that's a big part of kind of how we calibrated our expectations for, for this particular. And so uh, what do you say to this? What do you say to the student, for example, who, who's like, what do I do the, you know, what do I do in my application? You know, what, what do you, what advice do you give to students? Yeah. Like so my advice is to, you know, and, and students write in the COVID response. There's been students who've written like, I haven't been as close to my family in years. And like, I, you know, was so busy with life and piling on so many things that the student was like, to be quite frank, like I wasn't that excited about. I was doing this because I thought that more meant more and that colleges were going to be impressed with more. Mm -hmm. And that's absolutely not the case. I see lots of students who are like, I need to, you know, log thousands of hours of volunteer service to show schools that I care about other people. There are a lot of other ways that you can show that you care about other people than mm -hmm. logging hours in something that you don't truly feel is making an impact that you want to make. Mm -hmm. You can host webinars or provide services to community members um, to get them excited about a certain topic. You can understand and meet students at the moment, younger students who are struggling with learning and calibrating this pandemic, try to find ways and, and get other people to be more excited about virtual learning or to try and like generate that enthusiasm for students. If you're a tutor, right? Like that's something you can do. There's students who've like organized letter drives, card drives, who've taught themselves new skills and written in, in their you know activities page about like self-taught baking, self-taught mm -hmm. coding, self-taught Adobe, you know, creative suite, right? Like there's so many things that right now during and during this time that you can do a lot of independent moments of intellectual curiosity to really demonstrate to colleges that you you like to engage this noggin, right? Like you like to get the wheels turning, you like to think about things. And even if those standard activities that everyone thinks like, oh, I got to be the president of Key Club, I got to be the president of NHS, like captain of the soccer team, we see a lot of students who do that. Like mm -hmm. that's something that is, is it's like harsh to say, but like it's, it's more commonplace in our process than I think people think. And it truly is quality over quantity when it comes to reflecting on what these activities and initiatives what has the takeaway been for you? Like, what have you learned? What have, how have you grown? Um, that is more helpful to us in admissions than a laundry list of accolades that, right. to be quite frank, like a lot of people don't really care about as much. Like, it's not that we don't care, but we see very evidently that a student was doing things because they thought it was looking impressive and not out of sincere desire. So let, let's talk essays for a few minutes. Yes. What are some of those common topics that come in, come across your desk all the time? The ACL tear or around the world or some form of sports injury. Yep. Paul Revere, like, like he, he was ringing that bell. No, like it's, it's not to say that again, my sister is, was a college athlete. She played soccer all throughout high school. The being an athlete teaches you so much about teamwork, about resilience, about, um, pushing past challenges, but like that is just an essay that I've read so many times that it's just really hard for me to go in and be like, I'm excited to read this essay. Right. So this, I mean, take them off. Like, give us. A, can you give us like a top five? So that's the sports injury. What are your yeah. What are your other top five? Another one is grandparents or like people who are inspiring to you, and 75 percent of it is about those people and not about the student. Right. Different if you talk about you know how they inspired you to do things with your life or what that inspiration has played out for your own life, but it has to be about you. Right. That's one service essays only because oftentimes students write them from the, from the point of, wow, I went to this place, the people, I looked at them and even though they were poor, they were still so happy and it was very inspiring. And I realized how grateful I am for my own life. And then that's the end of the essay. And honestly, the way that a lot of people interpret that in admissions is like, you're noticing an injustice and rather than writing about how that injustice motivated you into action and you thought about what you can actually do to address inequities in the world, you kind of just wrote about how it was interesting for you to see that and only about kind of your world. Recognizing your privilege. Exactly. So that yeah. was, that's, that's one that definitely can be really tricky for students to do well. And again, it can, you can write about that topic, but the follow through about how it prompted action Right. needs to be present for that narrative to to hold to bear fruit and to hold weight in our process um so they're the three um losing a big game or like kind of like that kind of goes along with like sports injury essays like down to the wire two seconds left on the clock like yeah. we lost the score but we won in friendship like that is not going to really knock my socks off or like really make me be like i need this student here like um so those are a few that come immediately to mind. 
huge. Those yeah. are, I mean, the only one that in my brain is the the big performance essay where it's like they're getting ready to go on stage and you know there's like they give the speech or sort of you know that's the one I tend to see a lot. You're nervous. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm nervous, but I was able to do it, and you know, yeah. then I was able to do other things too. So, yeah. what, talk to us about two two part question. What do you look for in a personal statement, and how much do essays matter? I look for vulnerability and I look for honesty. And I think that I hope that, you know, the essays and the students who are being admitted are coming from a sincere place. And often you can really feel that um, in just the way that they're talking about their story and, and revealing to us what they've overcome, what they want to achieve, how they want to get there. Um, excitability. That's also something that like, I love to see. I love to see like quirkiness. Like, so we always bring up and we do this workshop at Pomona where we show people like what we, and actually, I, got, I got permission from the student. His name is also Ethan uh, to show like basically like an activities page that we were like, this student did this incredibly well. And his activities, again, were not like mind blowing Nobel Prize, you know, doing all these, you know, things that are just like lifetime movie story moments. Right. He just wrote. He was like, yeah, like I'm not the star uh, pitcher on the baseball team, but like I was there on the bench cheering him on. Like he was so good about like really owning what he was good at and being like, yeah, like I'm a great, like writing is my thing. I love tutoring. Like it's been so inspiring to help get people to a place where they see themselves as great writers too. Mm -hmm. And really kind of celebrating and being like, yeah, like this is something I love. This is something I'm good at. I excel in and I love to give back and use this talent for a greater purpose than myself. It's great to see also, also people being like vulnerable and self-deprecating and honest and being real and human. Because again, like I'm reading thousands of applications, there is a lot of similar verbiage and wording and just really dry presentation that just does not really make the student stand out. Right. Um, so I think those are definitely things that I look for in terms of a personal statement. And by and large, I mean, this is cliche advice, but just needs to be reiterated is about you. It has to be about you. And I mm -hmm. think so, so many students still write essays that are a topic that they love from school and it, it reads like a school paper or it reads like a biography of someone else. Um, and it shouldn't, the reader, the admissions officer should not leave that essay being like, I didn't really learn much about this student. Right. I also tell students, think of your application as a book. And if you're re reading the same chapter over and over again as an AO, like those are wasted opportunities in a chapter to reveal more about yourself that wasn't revealed in other parts of the application. So that's something to think about as well. Um, there's a second part to your question. It was, it was how much do essays matter? They do. Um, people, I think, don't think that they matter. And I think, to be completely honest, like I think that it depends on the volume of application and the school and the size that you are. Like, I have the luxury at Pomona. We have, we have a lot of applications, but we have a team and a way of dividing up the applications where I actually am able to really do a thorough, deep dive, line by line read to make that prep of mine, you know, with those quotes and recommendations and highlights to really go through and to honor these stories that are being told to us. Some schools, I mean, just with the volume of applications they receive, and especially this past year, you know, with test optional and then the rise in so many rates of applications, like there, in order to get the decisions out on time, like there has to be a sense of expediency with that. Mm -hmm. So it depends on the school and, and some, you know, schools are hopefully going to be honest with you about how much they evaluate their essays. Some schools don't, you know, require essays at all. It's just not a part of their process. I know a lot of international schools in particular, like our U.S. process with essays and writing samples and college specific supplements, like really doesn't, it's not a part of many other countries' admissions processes that they do. So um, for Pomona, it matters. Um, again, I can't speak on behalf of other schools quite as much. So there, there are two things that I really want to talk about, but because we have like 10 minutes left, I want to make sure we get to like some folks questions who are live on the session. And so what I want to flag with you and Tom, we kind of suspected this was going to happen. We're, you and I are going to do a part two and it's either going to be webinar style. Like I'm, I'm thinking either we'll follow up with the folks who signed up for this and be like, Hey, we'll schedule this to do with everybody. Or you and I will just sit down and have a deeper conversation about the student that we mentioned that connected us and um, demonstrated interest, which is a whole thing. But I, I wanna just actually jump into some questions and grab some, some of the questions from the chat box. And so maybe we can both sort of skim it and see which ones really, really jump out at us. Um, let's see, especially stuff that hasn't, oh, this is a good one. How does a student's ability to pay tuition impact their acceptance decision at Pomona? It's a good question. At Pomona, we are need blind for all students who are graduate or applying from U.S. high school. 
Um, so that includes students who are undocumented, students who are international students who are studying in the United States for their college or their high school degree. Um, what that means is that we're need blind. We are not looking at financial affordability as a factor in the admissions conversation. I don't have access to the documents. I don't know how, the assets that this family possesses. Um, we are need aware for international students um, who are applying from an international high school. Mm -hmm. um, uh, U.S. citizens abroad are also counted under the domestic policy, um, but international students with a non-U.S. citizenship who are studying outside of the United States, we do factor in um, affordability into the conversation there. And half of our admitted students, roughly half typically at Pomona, are receiving financial aid, and we meet 100% of demonstrated need. Mm -hmm. um, there were some folks who were interested in talking earlier, or especially earlier on before we got to essays, were interested in essay-related questions. Um, you know, actually, this might be a good chance to segue a little bit to talk about this, because maybe we could speak a little bit about the application of the student that we both know, because we could, you could maybe speak specifically, because it seems like there were a bunch of folks asking about particular applications. And this actually would segue to our sort of institutional priorities. So in terms of Pomona's institutional priorities, and this is a very narrow thing, but maybe you can give the context for the student that we're talking about and, 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 and talk about based on how you read that particular application, how did that, what did that student do well and how did it fit Pomona's institutional priorities? Great question and a great two birds with one stone moment. Love to see it. Um, genius. Um, so yes, the student that actually got Ethan and myself connected, we did, we had known each other actually uh, peripherally from another program that we had done at a great school in downtown LA called Downtown Magnets High School. Shout out. Shout out, Shout out Linda McGee. Uh, Linda McGee, she's, she's on it, man. Um, but so the student who um, I read was a student who came from a rural area of Ethiopia called Gambella. And this particular student um, wrote in his application, and the, I mean, the recommendations were as if the student was a prophet who was just such an anomaly for his area and just so motivated and driven. And I remember one of the quotes from the recommendation was like, this student, let's call him Tony. Like Tony was, you know, Tony says that he's going to come back after studying, you know, at, in the U.S. at a selective school with a politics and computer science degree. And so many people in our town say that he's crazy, but you know what? I, he's not. Like, I, I know this is going to happen. I have no doubt in my mind that he's going to come back here, have achieved these goals, because that is the type of person he is. And, I mean, these recs were just, like, on another level of superlative and just, like, clearly this student is just far surpassing his context in terms of what he's achieved and how he's how he's motivated himself to do so. So he wrote in his application about, you know, escaping genocide and um, uh, escaping political turmoil and, and violence and horrible atrocities like as a child. And now is in a place where his family is, you know, able to he's able to go to school. He's able to kind of try carve out a better life for himself. And he wrote about taking, you know, multiple day bus rides to Addis Ababa, the capital of Ethiopia, three days away from where he lives on the border with Sudan, Sudan, um, to go to college presentations that were being offered by these selective schools to get that face time to meet with them to be like, hey, I'm excited about your school. I, I will do what it takes to get there. And and I, I believe in myself and like I'm, I'm not going to stop until this this dream of mine becomes a reality that. I mean, just like really speaks mm -hmm. to grit. It speaks to resilience. It speaks to, um, and in terms of institutional priorities and kind of, you know, how the student fit into our process, like, you know, there's things about the student's application that I can't really say, you know, on this call for the sake of confidentiality that were priorities that Pomona was particularly looking for in the cycle. So, you know, institutional priorities at Pomona and many other schools take lots of different shapes. So, at some schools, there are certain academic programs that just too many students are applying or interested in. And because they want an academically balanced class, not all the students who are interested in Q most popular major or Q most popular topic are, are, are going to be admitted. Just mathematically, it is not possible right. um, to give all of our departments equal love in terms of right. students who are interested and an exciting student experience with students who have different academic interests, which is what Pomona is all about. So yeah. that's a part of it. Um, there's also, you know, athletes about uh, uh, 10 to 15 percent of our student body at Pomona are recruited varsity athletes who typically apply through early decision rounds. And there are also students who have coach support forms that are basically like validation of their athletic talent in later rounds of our process that we have, 
definitely um, more leeway with like coach support forms than we do for students who are recruits. Admission still makes the final say. We, they still have to be academically admissible. So they still have to meet what we're looking for and complete their application. We've had students who have not applied, like not fully completed the application. They did like a one sentence essay and we were like, nope, you got to do this again. That's not admissible. Um, music talent, you know, like the, the orchestra, they're losing two star bassoonists one year. We need to fulfill those spots. So a student needs to fit all of Pomona's intangible qualities and kind of ethos, but also needs to have this talent and needs to have like a submitted supplement that is documenting that they can contribute to the bassoon and the orchestra. So it does get that detailed and that granular and that micro, especially mm -hmm. for small schools like Pomona, where again, the class that's coming in is 415 students. And I'm not saying everyone go home and find an instrument that is really obscure, start taking up the French horn and become an, like an expert, do things that you love and other schools, are flush with bassoonists and like mm -hmm. that fact that you did that is going to be like oh you're, you're a dime a dozen but at, like at a Pomona in a certain application year some academic programs might be more attractive some instruments might be more attractive some positions on an athletic team might be more attractive mm -hmm. and that luck of the draw kind of situational year by year piece is a real part of this yeah yeah this the student by the way i just want to attest to this was a student who took one of my online courses found it you know, I don't know, online or something, two years ago, applied to a bunch of schools, didn't get into any of them, and then reapplied. So this was the second year that the student was applying. And anyway, it, it, it worked out really well. But what I want to say, and this is relevant to another question that I wanted to get into, but I don't know if we have a ton of time to, but how tough is it? Let's talk about international full need students as the student was. And full need means that the student needed maximum financial aid. How tough is it for for students who are international and full need to get in? You know, and I don't know what how specific you can get with the numbers, but I'd be curious. Get as specific as you can with that. Yeah, and and that's a you know, of course, we're leaving <laughs> leaving this webinar on a heavier topic because I I understand, especially after reading files from Africa this year, I understand how many high need international students are interested in, in college in the United States and are hoping to make this happen. And the, the unfortunate reality is that the, at the vast majority of colleges and universities, the financially budget for that particular pop population is more limited. There are some mm -hmm. schools that are able to have policies that are more generous. But at Pomona, for example, we very financially sound institution. We have lots of great resources. That part of our process is, is definitely more of a it's a harder part of our process because there are just far more talented, high need international students than we can take in. And, and the, the percentage is very small. I, I don't have, I can't really provide an exact number, but. That's fine. So I'm going to ask you a leading question. Mm -hmm. So students who are, and this is, this applies not just to international full need students, but students who are, let's say, I'm going to, I'm going to make an extreme. This is not anybody on this call, but students who are very obsessed with getting into a highly selective school and they're pinning their hopes on success equals getting into that school and failure is knocking that school. What advice would you give to those students? It's a super leading question. <laughs> it's, I'm, it's, I, I'm glad you asked this question because it's something that I, I really want to like dedicate my career towards having people rethink about this. I think a lot of students think that the degree is going to speak for them or the, the college that they go to is going to speak for them. And you have the, the voice and the platform to speak for yourself and to demonstrate why you're talented, why you're motivated, why you'll be a great employee at insert company. And that is a un, undeniable fact of your story and your trajectory, no matter where you go to college. You know, Cal State LA is one of the, the highest uh, colleges in terms of upward mobility for students mm -hmm. who are on the bottom 20% of the income bracket in the United States who eventually end up making it to the top 20%, right? Cal State LA is not as selective as Pomona. It is right down the street. And to say that sc certain schools are the only ones that are going to be able to make you anyone in this world and to be uh, someone who is contributing greatly to our, our world and our planet is absolutely not true. It is not true. And I think being a part of the 97% of students that I mentioned before is not anything to discredit or discount or, or, or think as a signal of failure. Like 97%, you are among friends, right? Mm -hmm. Like there are many people among you who are not going to these elite, elite colleges. And for students who are from the um, lowest economic uh, background, that can really be that upward mobility ticket for many students at these highly selected schools. For the vast majority of students um, who are, you know, high income, especially middle income, 
the difference between going to an Ivy League school and earnings potential and going to a less selective school is negligible. And I think that needs to be really understood because it's not the silver ticket bullet that people think it is, or it's not the essential thing that people think it is as well. So remember your drive, your ambition, your curiosity, your work ethic, and show people no matter where I went to school, you cannot take that away from me. And that is who I am. And that is who I will be. I love it. I, I So I, for some folks who are asking about some of these really practical things, like what should I be doing right now? And you're asking, you know, what should quote unquote average students, meaning they don't have a particularly interesting life. So how can they stand out on their apps? That's something that we're going to cover next week. We're going to have a separate webinar with Susan Tree. So I just want to invite folks to come for that. It's going to be practical. Here's the thing that you can be doing if you're you know, rising senior, even if you're ninth, 10th, 11th grade, and you're going to come with like links and resources and practical stuff. Tom, I'm, first of all, I just want to thank you for your time and energy. I'm, I could talk to you all day. And um, I want to do, I mean, I'd love to do a part two with you where we, where we just dig into some of these things a little bit more. And, I know, and, demonstrated interest. Like there's so many things I want to talk about, but time is of the essence, man. It, yeah, it is. Well, let's, let's do one more. Let's grab, do you have to talk okay. about more question? Yeah. Okay. Let's do one. Uh, a student asks, should you be decided in your major when you're applying to college or does that matter? Not matter so much. Not so, much. so glad this question was asked. No. Like 80% of students in the U.S. change their mind about their major from their initial point of application. It is not, the major is not what makes you at all. And I know it can be helpful when you're researching colleges and you want to get a sense for, okay, what types of programs are more attractive to me? You know, where are my gifts and talents going to fit in the best at this particular school? Oftentimes you're doing a lot of speculating about that. And you, it's until you get to the campus and interact with faculty and students and learn more about different programs that you're able to get a better sense for what major truly is best for you and what major truly is the best fit for your skills, your talents, your left brain, right brain, whatever mix you may be. So that absolutely does not need to be the case. And especially at a place like Pomona, a small liberal arts college where exploration and adventure and dabbling around and switching your path and winding is such a part of kind of what Pomona students are all about. Um, the major really should not be the sole angular narrow path um, and just being open to that flexibility is what I recommend. So for students who are undecided, that's not like immediately a no because they just, because they don't know what they want. Cause I think that's the fear, right? That if, oh, if I say I'm decided, I'm going to seem indecisive, right? My, gonna... advice to, my advice to those students is to, you can be indecisive, but don't be apathetic because mm -hmm. sometimes we'll get statements that are like, you know, I kind of like a lot of stuff. It's really interesting. You know, I could, I could see myself going a lot of places and that's it. Like talk a little bit about like, okay, at this point in time, here's what I'm thinking about. Here's what I'm curious about. I don't quite know how that's going to fit in at a college campus, to be honest. Um, but here's what excites me. And here's what I'm excited to explore in college. And I'm also excited for the possibility of change at a place like Pomona, where that's a part of our academic philosophy and our culture as a liberal arts college that emphasizes both breadth and depth. Like that type of answer is completely within line of Pomona's fit. Right. Right. Another thing that you're making me think of is supplemental essays, which we haven't even touched on yet. So for the part two, we'll do getting into the Pomona supplemental essays. That, that would be a fun conversation. Okay. Tom, thank you. It's so great to see you and connect with you. And I appreciate your generosity and your just your big yes. So Absolutely. Thank you, Ethan, for having me. Thank you all for tuning in. I know you're coming up from all different corners of the world, different ages, different reasons for why you attended this, whether you're a student or family or counselor, but I'm, I'm so honored to have been here and I hope this was helpful information. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And um, we'll be in touch real soon. And thanks all. Stay on the email list. We're going to follow up with not only practical steps, but then we're going to get into like when it's time to write the essays and things that's all coming y'all. So stay tuned. All right. Thanks again. And I'll see you soon. Bye. Bye.